Got any bow hunters in here? Do we have any rifle Woo! hunters in here? Any Weatherby fans in here? Yeah. I know there's some in the back. <laughs> well, I'm a Weatherby fan too, and they are uh, with. Uh, they're my title sponsor this year, and I just want to say that uh, I appreciate them uh, being here, being a part of this, and allowing me to uh, do the things that I do and, and, and be a partner in it. And they've they've given us some stuff to to give away. So uh, just want to say. Thanks to those guys for being here. Thank you all for coming out. Can you hear me good in the back? I'm not going to run a microphone today because I just like to move around. I got adult ADD so bad I can't even see straight. And so I like to move around. I like to go around and say hi to everybody. Doing, man, how you doing? Thank you for coming out today. Pops, thanks for bringing them out today. Nice to see you, sir. Hey, how you doing? Good. How are you? Right, man, nice to see you. All right, awesome. So I like. We're going to talk about backcountry hunting. We're going to talk about mule deer hunting. How many have been to my seminar before? And you came back. Mm -hmm. Got some new faces in here. I didn't expect to see so many people today, uh, middle of the day on a Friday. But there's so much going on, so many celebrities on the floor, so many great people out there with products and services that you chose to come listen to me or to learn something means everything to me. So I thank you all so much for that. It, it truly humbles me. I see some fantastic people in the crowd, great friends of mine, hunting partners, longtime friends, family. Just appreciate you coming out. It's really isn't about me. This is about you. Public land backcountry hunters. So if you've been to my seminars before, I've talked about high country hunting. I've talked about bow hunting. I've talked about shooting. And it's always something around mule deer. Today's a little different. And um, I didn't even hunt mule deer in 2017. So I always depend on the current season to gather new data to come say, hey, this is something new I learned. This is something I really screwed up on. Don't do this, right? That's what I'm always about, trying to help you guys out soften that learning curve a little bit. Well, 2017, I didn't draw a mule deer tag, but I banked some pretty cool points. So all I can tell you is if you like today's seminar, next year's is gonna be awesome because I'm gonna have some cool tags and I got some rifle tags and some bow tags coming and uh, I'm gonna have, with some blessing from the Lord, I'll have, a, I'll have a blessed season next year. So that's what I'm looking forward to. But what I did is I went back over the years that I've been doing these seminars and the things that we've always talked about and the questions that you've always had. And I said, you know, I'm just going to key in on these things. So at any point, back up a little bit. I do Q&A. This is an interactive. I'm not a talking head. I'm not just up here talking about my experiences. This is truly for you. So if I'm talking about something and it just sparks something in you and you're like, man, I want to ask Mark what he does here or there or what's going on, just raise your hand. I'm not going to wait till the very end because I've always run out of time. Then I end up taking all these hats and t-shirts from my fantastic partners and I throw them at you and it uses everybody gathers stuff up and they run out. Well, all of these things are cool. They're marketing tools, but they represent dollars, right? The people that give you stuff, that represents somebody's money, right? So ask me a solid question and I either may hand you something, but if I've got another question coming, just come up and grab yourself something off the stage real quick. I got a bino system. This is pretty cool from Badlands. These are one of my partners. We have some hats, got some mountain ops. Those are partners. These are all products I use. Did any of y'all go over to see the booth with Mount Epic? The Bigfoot guys? That's a Bigfoot hauling an elk shed. It doesn't still get any cooler than that. Well, if he had a Weatherby Mark V in his other hand, it might be cooler or a Hoyt bow or something like that. But that's awesome. That's like the ultimate hunter, right? Bigfoot. So Bill over there at Mount Epic is a cool guy. Go by and see him after the show. Tell him I sent you over and get some of his shirts and hats. And if you do end up with a shirt that doesn't fit, he said bring it over to him. They'll trade it out for one that you want. So he handed me some stuff. So with that said, um, I'll show you what we're going to talk about. Essentials. This is. I'm just going to start talking. Something prompts you and you're like, hey, I want to know about this. Just ask me. We'll just talk about it. Why backcountry? What is backcountry? Everybody in here know what backcountry is? It's not road hunting, right? It's like the absolute not road hunting is backcountry <laughs> hunting. If you take 10 steps off the road, you might be backcountry. But, you know, I would say probably at least a quarter of a mile is backcountry. But that's everybody's backcountry is their own. Where I, I, live in, I live in Texas now. I was out in Colorado for 20 years, New Mexico for five years, but I'm a Texan. If you can't tell from the twang, I'm a Texan. Uh, but I still come out every year. And so where I hunt down in East Texas, hardwood bottoms, I live in East Texas. It's more like Louisiana or what you'd see in Mississippi or something over there where I hunt. 
I'm still known as the guy that goes way back down to the bottoms to get my bucks for my, I don't like to hunt the feeders. I don't like to hunt the roads. I like to get off back in the bottoms. I hunt from a P row or a canoe a lot. I'll get back in the back country of where I hunt in Texas just so that I can have a truly wild experience. I'm a guy that just looks for adventure. You know, when I was a little kid, I didn't have Superman or Batman on my pajamas. I had Davy Crockett, right? I'm a Texan, but Davy Crockett, I'm an adventure guy. I like that stuff. So if I'm going hunting, I want to go have the rawest, purest hunting experience that I can have. So that's why I hunt the backcountry. And that backcountry is whatever your backcountry is. I can't say the Wasatch Front, that's backcountry. How many of y'all hunt the Wasatch? How many of y'all don't want me to talk about the Wasatch? <laughs> okay, done. We won't talk about it. <laughs> no, I love the Wasatch. I've hunted it for three years straight. And, uh, or I hunted it 14, 15, 16, right? Killed bucks those three years. I came in 2011 and it liked to kill me. I hunted the November hunt and I just can't deal with snow and cold. So I'm a warm weather guy, Texan. So I came, I started hunting this hunt up here for three years. I hunted the, hunt, the, the early season and shot three, at least four on one side bucks. Not, it was a great hunt, I love it. But I consider the Wasatch a backcountry hunt. But I don't live in the Salt Lake Valley. I don't live in some of these towns where guys drive up to the trailheads on any of those canyons and hike in in the dark. This is a good subject. Reason is why I want a true backcountry experience, but I'm the guy that's on top of the mountain every morning watching the headlights bobbing coming through the trees in the bottom of the dark. And I see them, it's like an army. It's just like, on the weekend, you're blinded by the light. You can land an airplane up there in the Wasatch from all the headlamps. But um, I see those guys coming in and out every day. And I talk to them. You know, if I see a guy, hey, man. A lot of times I see guys, middle of the day, well, we'll both be stalking bucks. Because if you're on the Wasatch and you're stalking a buck, there's somebody else stalking that buck, too. That's just the way it goes. But I, I'll talk to them. And they say, oh, I just live in Sandy. Or I just live over in here or there or wherever. And, I just drive up for the day. And I, when I talk to them, I realize their success rate on hunting on the Wasatch is a lot lower than my success rate. I'm three for three. Four point bucks. Now, I'm not, a, I'm not one of the big buck killers. I don't live here. I find a nice buck that I'd be proud to take home to Texas and I shoot it. But the advantage I have is I'm already there. I've already got a plan. I, I get up there above the, tr the bucks. I stay above the bucks. I watch them. And make a play on them. And I'm the buck I killed uh, in 16, I shot him at like 6.55 a.m. I didn't know where he was at. I had a window of time with the wind opportunity. I knew how the wind was going to be. I talked about that last year, if y'all remember that story. And um, I used that to my advantage. And I got him early. So if you are a Wasatch hunter and you are hunting from home and you're going up every day, but you're having a pretty low success rate, because what's happening is unless you leave at like 2 in the morning, a lot of guys, I see their headlights, and I know for a fact, even if you are the fastest, best guy on the mountain, you're not going to be where I'm at in a prime position when you need to be. And what we saw, me and Corey saw two years ago, got great bucks bedded in a bowl, got above them, watching them, just about the time we decided to make a play on them at 10 a.m., what happened? Three dudes, or four, right, come out of the bottom, blow those, go right through the bed where those bucks were at. Messed up the hunt, messed up the opportunity. <coughs> so uh, that, that's in a nutshell. So backcountry is what you want it to be, whatever you think backcountry is. Like I said, I think the Wasatch is a backcountry hunt. Now, I spent 15, 16 years hunting in Colorado in their backcountry. I've hunted with these guys in Nevada in a, in a wilderness area. We, we go 12 miles before we even start hunting. So. Not to take away from anybody's experience, there's just different levels of backcountry. And one of the reasons that I like backcountry, or the main reasons, are solitude. It's a pure, a more pure experience, right? I'm getting back, I'm having an adventure hunt. It's mainly me. I don't have as much of a crowd. Bigger bucks? I don't know. I don't, I don't know that. I know that I can find mature deer. And when I'm talking about a big deer, I'm not a score guy. I'm not talking about inches. I'm just talking about a big old mature buck with a big belly like me, and I just want to kill one that's got a great cape and <laughs> a nice belly on him, one that breeds does. I want to shoot a mature buck. So if you want to putt around the National Forest in your, from your four-wheeler, your truck, jump out and fling arrows at two-year-old three-points, man, do it. You want to go get you a fork and horn every year and put one in the freezer? 
Do it. There's nothing wrong with that. That's what you want to do. Do it. But if you want to add some adventure, if you want to add some experience to your hunt, try getting a backpack. And don't start off going 15 miles like these guys do or 10 miles like I do. Start off with a mile. Start off with two miles. Start off right here on your Wasatch Front. Just go up. Take some water because I can promise you there's no water there. You're not going to find any. I've looked for four years. If you know where some's at, you've got a magic spot and hang on to it. But water's tough. We had to... Had these guys help me a lot of times haul water. You know, we'll haul four or five gallons at a time up that mountain. That's tough. But if you want to be there, you got to have water. So, and that leads into the challenge. I just love the challenge of that. The challenge of that kind of a hunt. I want, I want it to be. So here's the deal. Y'all want to? You want to shoot a nice buck and you want to be able to share it with the world and say, Hey, I got this buck. And you're never. I'm never going to hold one like this. You know, it's like this, or I, I bring it in, it's like, man, I got my buck this year. This is my buck from the Wasatch, right? There's nothing wrong with that if, if that's your experience level, that's what you want to do, do that. I'm going to keep it real, and if I kill one this big, I'm going to set, I'm going to hold it just like this. You're going to see how big it was, right? But the thing is, is if, when you do go hunt like that, and you do have some success, and you shoot a deer with your bow and arrow, or even a rifle on a hunt, we'll talk about some muzzleloader and rifle hunting too, it makes it more rewarding. When you have to do that, just for me, a personal, a personal thing. And if you've not had that experience, I highly suggest you go try it. It just feels, it feels right. It feels good. So before you go do something like that, you've got to decide: hey, Do you want to go by yourself, or do you want a hunting partner? Now, this is a touchy subject. I'm going to cover it real quick, but I think it's important enough that we talk about it. Okay? I'm a person that truly believes. Relationships are 100-100. They are not 50-50. Been married to my wife 30 years. Our relationship is 100-100. I give her 100%, she gives me 100%. If I give her 50%, she gives me 50%. Where's the other 50%? Right? What, well, what's your other 50%? I, need, I might need 75 today. I need 99 almost every day. So I need a lot of help. So here's the deal. If you go hunt in the backcountry, you save a lot of time, your vacation, right? You save money, and you have a lot of resources tied into what you're fixing to go embark upon, correct? You're awake, right? So, yeah, I'm fixing to go hunting. I'm going to take my vacation. I waited all year to go on this hunt, and I want to go shoot a buck or a bull, but I don't want to go by myself. Well, I met this guy at the archery bridge last week. He's a cool guy. His name's John. And he, man, he showed me how to shoot my release, and I like him. He said, let's go elk hunting together. And, and he asked, have you ever been on a backcountry hunt? No, I've never been on a backcountry hunt. Oh, you want to go with me? Yeah. He is not looking at you because he sincerely hopes and prays that you kill the biggest buck on the mountain. He's like, I got somebody to help me pack my bull out. I'll promise you that's what he's thinking about. So when I choose a hunting partner, I've been that guy. I've been the guy that's done that to other folks, and I've been the guy that's had that done to them. If I'm going to come from Texas to Colorado, and I'm going to go hunt or Utah, if I'm going to go hunt a backcountry hunt, 7, 8, 10, 12 days, and I'm going to go with someone else, a partner, that person, I have to already commit that I want to see them kill and get their buck or bull more than I want for myself. Because what's, happened, what's going to happen is me and Corey decide we're going to Colorado and we're going to the wilderness. On, we're there for 7 days. On day 4... Corey shoots a bull. On day two, that's getting that bull broke down, brought to somewhere where we can get an outfitter in there to get it packed out or pack it out ourselves. We pack it out ourselves, it's we're into day five and six. I got one day left. If you're not fully committed to your partner to say, I will, I'm not going to leave you with a thousand pounds of meat to rot. I'm a decent human being. I got to help you. I got to love you enough to say, I will stop, honey, and help you pack that out. You guys may be going, yeah, man, I'm cool. Man, you're, you're kind of a butthole to do that to somebody. I've never, I've not done that to someone. You might think this is elementary, but I'm telling you, if you don't think this through and you're not perfectly honest with yourself up front, you're going to get into a bind on a hunt like that, and you're going you're to have a fight on the mountain. You could absolutely have an argument. You could lose a friendship over it. But make sure if you're going to go, say you and your buddy want to get a Dr. Pepper and go put down the two-track roads with your bows and shoot forking horns off of the logging roads, that's one thing. You don't really need a plan. But if you're going to decide to go into the backcountry, 
spend days. Those people that I posted pictures of, these are these people mean everything to me. That guy on the left has uh, been my friend since 1982. I met in high school. We started shooting bows together the same year, 1982. That's on the elk hunt in Colorado. I wanted to see him kill an elk more than I've ever wanted to kill one. I, I want him to have that. Jeremy Duggar, my very best mule deer hunting buddy. That's his buck from Colorado two years ago. I will give up my entire hunt to help him pack a buck out. Tommy Young, supposed to be here. I don't see him in the crowd. That's my cousin. That's the guy that got me into bow hunting. He's the guy in the middle. I want to see him get one. Yeah, in the back. Way in the back. Question is, 10 miles in, am I hunting from the truck to my 10-mile marker? Do I hunt my way in? Is that what you're saying? No, man. If season's open and I got my weapon, I'm looking. I'll shoot him five yards from the trailhead, <laughs> and I'll drag him just far enough away and prop up pictures. I'd make you believe I killed that thing on Mount Everest, brother. <laughs> but... I'm going to keep it real. But no, I'm, I'm in stealth mode, full-blown hunting mode from the instant I get out of my truck. From the instant I get out of the truck, if I see an animal that I can legally hunt and want to harvest, I'm going to shoot it. From there to Timbuktu and back. But on the deer hunts that we do, the backcountry deer hunts that I do with Team Backcountry and stuff, I, uh, we, when we go like to Nevada... Usually, it's like this. They might would do that, but on my tongue's hanging out, I'm like this. <laughs> it's hard for me to shoot deer like this. <laughs> this is how I am most of that 12 miles, right? <laughs> but if they saw a buck, if we're going in and season's been open a day or two and we're hiking in and Corey or Dustin sees a buck up on the ridge that trips their trigger, oh, we'll abandon the pack in right now and go shoot it, right, guys? Amen? Amen. 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 So, come on up, man. Just come up here and pick you out something. I'll just keep talking. Right here, sir. Great shirt. And you pack in the opening day of season? Or you We try to get in a couple days early. A couple days early. You like, you like mountain ops? Have you ever tried it? Here, man. I'm no, don't be no Tom Brady now. <laughs> All right. Take a look. See what you want. Um, anybody else? Oh, right there, sir. Yeah. My, my question is in regards to, if, if you're a solo hunter, uh, first off, how much research do you do prior to arriving in that state? And then if you hunt for seven days, how do you battle the psychological war when you're beat down on the third day, you're tired, you, you're trying to find excuses to quit, pack out early? How, how do you combat that to stay positive and that question comes up every single seminar I've ever done, ever. And thank you for asking it. And it touches on a deep subject, but I'm going to give you the brief overlay. Anybody remember that one from last year? Robbie Denning could answer that one for you. Um, I live a life. I'm just going to tell you the truth. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not a saint. I'm, I'm not even a deacon. But here's the deal. I try to live a good life. And I know people, and I've been around the back hunting industry long enough to know that those that are successful live a lifestyle that when you get alone in the wilderness, when you get by yourself away from the sound of your phone, the airplanes, the traffic, things like that, your life goes under this giant microscope and every bad decision, every bad thing you've ever said to your mother, every fight you've ever had with your brother, everything that you regret with your father, when you get alone in the backcountry, God puts this gigantic magnifying glass on that for you. And that starts working on your guilt. It starts working on your loneliness. Okay? You ask me a serious question. I'm giving you the best answer I can. Get all of your affairs in order. Don't, don't spend money you don't have on things that you don't need. Don't push off things at work. Don't skip soccer games with your children leading up to this. Do, do your due diligence. Do your part so that when you go on a backcountry hunt, you can turn the world off with zero conscience and go hunt. Now, all of that's going to be between you and the maker. You and the creator are going to be doing that part. But, now, I'm wet. I ate my best food the first three days. I don't have a guilty conscience. I'm just ticked off. So, I ate all my best food the first three days. I'm wet. 
Now, how do I stay motivated? Well, what motivates me and what motivates my friends is there's only one August or one September every 12 months. If I decide on day five that I'm not going to go to day seven, eight, or nine, and I go home, it is a long time before that cycle comes back. So I just have this thing in me where I grit it out, and I just make it work, man. I don't know what else to tell you. I look at hunting. I used to look at hunting based on success. I Now I've changed, and I look at hunting based on an experience. Yes. That's the way I, I'm able to get through those days. But it's tough. It's, I mean, when you're out there, back there by yourself, and you're not seeing the deer that you want to see or not seeing the things you want to see, you start to find excuses on quitting. Yeah, absolutely, man. Yeah. I just don't want to take that question. Yeah. 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 Thank you so much. But that's, it ain't tough. And you go, man, I, I want to... I want to be successful. It's a long time until I get to do it again. Somebody right if you're close had a question, and I'll come back to the back of the room. Yes, sir. Your buddy shoots a big deer, and you're helping him pack it out. And you say you hunt all the way in. You're going to hunt all the way out, too? While yeah, man. It out? You dang right. <laughs> this is the last chance. You know, I'm hunting all the way out to the last light. If I, if I can see that. and it's legal and I can shoot, man, I'm still looking because I... It's a long time between seasons, and I want success. And if I go two or three years and I don't shoot one, what am I going to talk to you about up here, right? I mean, I have my own reasons for hunting, but I really love sharing these experiences with you guys. And when you go deerless for a long time, or without a buck or a bull or whatever, but it's not about killing animals no more, not at my age. It is truly what that man just said. It's about the experience. It's about having that experience. So uh, you want to come up and get yourself something? You look you like you come get you something. So... Right there in the center, sir. Yeah, so uh, on your uh, on the website, say we're doing fitness preparation and so I think Yes. Uh, I don't, no one up there looks like they're a CrossFit champion. Nope. So. These aren't backcountry hunters. And you do that. <laughs> what would be your recommendation for prepar preparing for a season uh, for backcountry hunting as far as fitness? I don't lift weights hardly anymore. I, those that know me know three years ago, I changed my life. I was 250 pounds, 248, size 42 waist. I had a desk job. I'd given up. I thought I could just go on pure will and get it done until I hunted the Ruby Mountains with these guys. And I said, well, no, they shamed. They had to carry my gear in. It's embarrassing. And I said, I'm not ever going to do that again. So I changed my life. And I hired a trainer, and I got with Mountain Ops, and I wanted some good supplements, and I started using their supplements and working out and, you know, doing all that stuff. But now it's just my lifestyle. And what I would suggest is you don't have to go lift weights. You don't have to be an ultra marathon runner, though it would help you a lot if you got into that. But what I do is a lot of cardio. I do cardio. I don't, and I do not wait till September or July, August to do this. Hunting is my life. It's what I like to do. I want to be successful at it. So I train all year long for it. I don't, I don't believe I'm a professional athlete. I don't train like I'm an athlete. I don't look like an athlete. But I have very good cardio. And I, can, I can't run very fast, but I can run very, very far. I can, go, I can just go a long time. I do cardio five days a week, and I'll do plyometrics three of those days, meaning I do a lot of box jumps, push-ups, uh, using my own body weight to, to stay in shape. What I would suggest, if you're wanting to get into some kind of fitness program, spend a lot of time on the ground, because here's what people don't realize. You get out of bed, you get in your truck, you go to your desk, you get out of your desk, you get in your truck, you go home. You get in your easy chair, you watch TV, and you go to bed. Never at any point at our age, I'm 47, something seriously wrong has gone on at my home if I'm on the floor. There's something bad just happened. I'm fixing a water leak, my toilet exploded, something happened. You don't find yourself on the ground. When you go on a backcountry hunt, you spend 99% of the time on the ground. Guys, do you remember when I put my boots on in camp and you'd be over there laughing in your tent? You could hear me. I'm rolling around, <laughs> grunting, trying to get over my belly to tie my shoes. Just that, just, just the act of tying my shoes, sitting on the ground, is discomforting. I'm not used to sitting on the ground. But here I'm going to go out for seven days, sit on the ground, glass bucks, crawl, chase bucks, tie my shoes. When you, what I like to do are Russian twists. Everybody in here ever done Russian twists? Oh, they're awful. They are the best thing you can do as a backcountry hunter. Just sit down and do them to failure with about 10-pound ball. Just do Russian twists, crunches, setups, knee-ups, things like that. That help you out. That's what I do, and that's what I suggest you do. 
That's what I suggest these guys do. But <laughs> good, good luck with that. And uh, don't forget, come get yourself something or whatever. Yes, sir. Well, you're saying that cardio, though. Are you saying you know, five miles? No. Five miles? I don't have to do five miles to feel good about sweating. What I like to do is an hour of cardio. And I just saw, I wondered if what I do is enough, right? And uh, I don't know how the old Jim Shockey is. But Jim Shockey, I know, is a little older than me. But I had a real aha moment the other day because I know what I do on the treadmill is I just set the thing, I take, I take off in stages. And when I end my treadmill work, I don't run. Running's bad for your knees. At my age, it's way bad for your knees. But I walk, and I set that incline at 15, that's as max it'll go, at a 4.2. And I can walk fast. And, then, you know, I don't go fast, but I go far, right? And this is my, my voucher right here. So I set it at 4.2 at 15 incline, and I just walk for a solid hour, and I'm drenched. But I noticed that when I go on a run down, the, you know, I'll run like a mile at my house every other day. I'll just run around the block two, twice. That's a mile. Man, I can run really good. Well, anyway, Jim Shockey just said, he said, I spent one hour and five minutes or something on the treadmill at a 13.5 at a 3.2. I was like, Jim <laughs> Shockey. <laughs> so as, as, as sorry as that is, I had a good feeling about it. Yeah. The truth. Yeah. Like yeah, I can run about right now. I can probably run about an eight-minute mile. <laughs> I ain't gonna win no marathons or 5Ks, but I feel good at that speed. But I know in the mountains with a now, what I'll do is, and, and the guys at 24-Hour Fitness where I work out, they look at me pretty funny, but they've gotten used to it now because August 1st on my birthday, I always put two 25-pound dumbbells in my Badlands pack, and I get on the stairmaster for 45 minutes at about a six. That'll get you hiking. That'll get you in good hiking mode. So real quick, did I cover those questions? Um, got the little guy in the front. Little guy in the front. Right oh, man. With that shirt on, you think I'd see you, huh? What's up, buddy? Um, so what if you were walking in, like, heavy gear and you walked so long? How do you stop yourself or keep going? If I have a deer on my back? So the question is, if I shoot a deer... I put him in my backpack and I put him on and I start walking. Do I stop and rest? Is that the question? Yeah. I'll rest more than I walk. I go a lot slower. It ain't no 4.2. But I might do a 2.2. But I get out. Yes, sir. Go up there. Come over here. Let's see what you got. Let's see what we got for you over here. Find something real special. You like hats? You don't wear flatties with stickers on them, do you? That's a mall hat. Mall hat. Special hat. when I was a kid. I had my first child at 18, my daughter. She's 28 or 9 now. Travis is 26. Um, I raised both of my kids in the backcountry, bow hunting. I took them both, and they could they just go wherever I could go. My daughter has experienced a backcountry hunt where we killed a buck together. I killed it. My son has been in a bunch of them. I have not taken any other children that aren't mine in the backcountry, but i got six grandkids now. So... They're all going to grow up in the backcountry if I have anything to do with it. But I sometimes, man, I've, I've thought about starting a program, a mentoring program where I get partners involved and we do a few little packs and little things and take them on little trips, right? But I've not done that, and it's, you know, a weird world we live in today, but, man, I'd be all for it, you know, for sure. But I've not personally taken any kids that aren't mine. Is that... Is that answer? Well, or even yours. Just my kids grew up in yeah, the back country. My grandkids grew up. Any keys to make it that successful? My son was 13 when he carried his first everything on his pack and climbed 12,000 feet. He was 13. My daughter was. My daughter had just joined the Navy. She was 19, and she was on her way to boot camp and happened to come home. I had this big wilderness trip planned. This goes back to that question he asked. I had this trip 
Women Nutri Wilderness, Colorado. Big trip plan. Scouted. All made the trip from Colorado Springs down to the Women Nutri three times. <coughs> Finally scouted me a 200 inch buck with inline cheaters. I had everything set. Uh, you and Jeremy Duggar were on the mountain, I think, that day. Was that wilderness again? I didn't hear it right. But anyway, it's not yeah, it's not there anymore. It went away. <laughs> but anyway, I don't hunt anymore, so I got loose lips about it. Sorry about it. But anyway, I go down there, and my daughter, she's going to go to the Navy. She can't go. Or, or she, I'm going to miss her part of this trip. So I really started thinking about it. Man, I really want to go shoot this buck. I really want to spend time with her. So I asked her, would you like to go hunt? She, yeah, I'll go. Well, she didn't have any gear at that point in her life. So we went and bought some Walmart boots. I've got an extra pack. We go hunting, and we climb up there in the dark. We camp out, and she's having fun until her feet are hurt. We're going to cover that. Bad Walmart boots. Bad cotton socks. Bad idea. right? So, But she's trying. She's got bloody feet, trying to keep up. And she's like, Dad, I wanted to have fun. This is not fun anymore. So I had to turn myself off. I got to switch the mechanism. Okay, whoa, whoa, whoa. This is not fun anymore. This is not fun for my daughter. I want to spend time with her. But every time I parked at the trailhead all summer to pack in there, there was always three or four bucks living right around that trailhead. So what I did is that night, I said, you know, I, I didn't say, hey, we're going to go road hunting and kill a buck. I just said, hey, we're going to go look at some country. So I just kind of turned into this thing where we're driving along dark. I'm road hunting. But she thought we were looking for sign. Or I had it. We were in our old scout. I'm making it an adventure, right? And we're just telling stories. And I was like, oh, I think I saw something back there. And I'm back up and I can see that little herd of bucks up there I've seen all summer. So I take off and we go this way. And she's following me. And then I'm, oh, right there. Look. She, oh, yeah, I see when we killed a four by three with our bow. And that was awesome, right? So I made it about her, but it's still a great experience. So, yeah, so do you want to, whenever you want to come grab something. Come, come, come on, get it or I'll forget about it. Uh, real quick, man, i got to pay some bills here. Let's see, uh, what time we got? Anybody got time? 103. 103? Okay, Real quick, I'm a bow hunter mostly, primarily. I've gotten into, I've always been a rifle guy. I've gotten into some guns. I love rifle hunting. I love Weatherby. I love the brand. I love the people. I love the family. They have a booth here. They've become partners of mine. And because of their generosity, I wanted to give them a plug today. I'm not a big commercial guy, but I'm just telling you, it's American-made companies, American brands started right here in the USA. This year, for the ladies, they got the Mark 5 Subalpine, and then last year they broke out with the Camilla. If you're a lady and you want to go hunting, I know Dallas Haymeyer's wife, Victoria, just killed a whole bunch of stuff with a 6.5 Creedmoor in that Camilla. It's a really good gun. So if you are a rifle hunting lady and you want to look at something that's made for ladies, go to the Weatherby, Weatherby booth and ask them to show you a Camilla. They'd be glad to show you. They're awesome. Yes, sir. They got the good youth guns, too? What's that? Youth? Yes, sir. They have one that you can grow into. It has segments in the stock that you can grow along with in the lower calibers, 243, 308, stuff like that. I think the 65 Creed more. They may even break into the long action on those. I'm not sure. But you can ask them about it, the youth gun, but they do. And these guns right here are made for ladies. And it's, 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 it's a weird topic, but the curve of the stock curves this way. So ladies have said it really fits them nicely. They can get behind the gun because they're always struggling trying to find something that feels good. On these Camillas, the stock curves just so slightly. It makes a, a good fit. So uh, check that out. That's all I'm going to say about that. If you are a gun nut, if you are a maximum, maximum kind of person, whether we partner with Proof Research this year, they fish the carbon barrels on Mark 5s. Yes, sir, in a white shirt. What percentage of the time are you packing? How many, how, how much am I packing? What percentage of the time are you packing a gun? Uh, oh, in Colorado, 100% of the time. In Colorado, I had bears tear me up, tear my tent up one time. And from that, I never carried a gun. No, I'll never not carry a gun. But I had a bear tear my tent up when I was in it one night. So Colorado is the only state you're concerned about? Yeah, yeah. Uh, only because I lived there so long and I knew the laws. Uh, I see a lot of bears in Utah. I'm not really even real sure what the law here is. And when I'm in the Wasatch, I see so many human beings, I never even feel scared at night. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> but in Colorado, sometimes I am scared of the dark. Sometimes I'm scared of the things I hear at night. You know what, man? I'll tell you the truth about all that. I chew a bear in the face if it gets in my tent. No questions asked. <laughs> but more importantly, uh, people that aren't supposed to be in the United States and people with bad intentions want to carry a gun. Because I'm by myself so much, 
that I went and got licensed to carry. I have a concealed carry. I carry a Glock 19 on me all the time. And but I'm not a I'm not a handgun guru. I'm just a guy that picked one gun and said I'm gonna get really good with my gun. And I shoot my gun really good and I know it inside and out. And if something ever gets after me, whether a human or a beast, I'm gonna put all 15 in it, whatever it is, until it stops quivering, right? So that's my that's what I'm gonna do. I'm not about stop the threat. I'm gonna demolish the threat, man. I don't want nothing to get me. So so I carry the gun for that. That's mainly why. And I have encountered and especially, what, 2012 when the laws changed in Colorado? I love Colorado. Man, I lived there 20 years, but I'm going to tell you some weirdos. There's a lot of weirdos that live in a lot of the cities that find themselves in the mountains relatively close to cities. And they have bad intentions. And that's just it, transients. Illegal aliens and transients, man. That's, that's why I carry a gun by myself. And I love my grandkids. And I want to get back to see my grandkids, right? So, does that answer your question? Okay. And again, come find yourself something when you're ready. Okay. This rifle right here on the bottom, I'm going to shoot that this year at 6.5-300 Magnum. It's the Weatherby Mark V FDE. That's six and three-quarter pound. But it's got a 28-inch barrel in the 6.5 Magnum because it's got a muzzle brake. And if you don't, if you take a six and three-quarter pound rifle in 6.5 by 300 Magnum without a muzzle brake, you're probably not going to be very accurate with it because you're going to be flinching the whole time you shoot it because it's got a pretty good to it. So anyway... If you don't want to spend $4,000 on a gun, which, hey, I understand, they got some awesome guns right here. The first light runs for just under $1,100, and it's got a Cerakoted uh, flat dark earth barrel action on the first light camo. I'm a Badlands guy, but that first light's pretty slick looking. I know Weatherby was really proud of that. And the gun I have personal experience with is the one actually called the Backcountry. Both of that, the, the, the first light's a little heavier, but the Backcountry is... In standard caliber, six and three quarter pounds before it's scoped, and I shoot that in a 270 Winchester or 240 Weatherby Magnum. The 240 was an experiment. I played with it, but I'm an old 270 guy, 130 grain nozzle partition kind of guy, or Barnes X bullet. So those are great guns. I just wanted to, just briefly, I just want to give you some exposure to these fine folks and the, the products. And uh, the packs is the next thing. Packs and feet footwear. We got to cover that. All right. Where are we at on time? One. And I'm d I go to one ten. I go to one thirty. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, cool. Who <clears throat> use Badland packs? Anybody? Cool, man. Good Utah company. I've been with, I've been using them off and on since 1998. First backpack I ever bought to go into the backcountry was in 1998. Been using them, but I've tried. Yes, sir. The hand right there with your hand going up and down. What are some of the less common things that are in your pack that you would most people would think about that you find really essential? Cool. Uh. Kool-Aid? I, I never go, man, you're going to laugh. Back to his question. What keeps me upbeat? I love mountain ops. I used to like wilderness athlete. It was good stuff. I like mountain ops. You know what I really love? You know what I just, I, it makes my whole day better. It makes the sunshine and the bird scene. Fruit punch Kool-Aid. If I forget fruit punch Kool-Aid, the one that's already sweet and he's putting a water bottle, my day is just, it's just not going to go right. I love, I love that. I use it a lot. Does it save my life? No. Is it ridiculous to talk about? Yes. But these guys, they get big smile on their face. I'm like, hey, y'all want some Kool-Aid? <laughs> and they're like, man, you know I want some Kool-Aid. So we all drink Kool-Aid. Uh, something I've never had that we whittled to make a screwdriver out of to fix my stabilizer this year is a long handle spoon. I don't have one, but I promise you, before you see me again, I'm going to own one. Corey introduced me to that. It's like it's like this long. Have you ever tried to eat Mountain House with a regular spoon and you get stroganoff knuckles? You know, I think somebody said that the other day. You get stroganoff knuckles. Well, a long spoon it weighs nothing. What's that thing made out of? Titanium? Something? I mean, it's I mean nothing. But we we couldn't hardly cut it. My stabilizer adapter got loose. It was rattling. I was shooting grass and my bow's going bam bam every time I shoot them. Well, we tried to find something. Maybe find an ultra lightweight tool or something right next time. But anyway, Corey goes through his pack. I'm going through my stuff, trying to find something to tighten this thing up with. So the end of the spoon, we took the cutters on a Leatherman and started cutting until we got a point on it, and it actually worked. It tightened my thing up, and we kept on hunting. So uh, a long spoon. These guys are absolutely the masters at backcountry hunting that are sitting in the front row here that I'm embarrassing right now. Um, throw something at me that you carry that people wouldn't know you carry. 
Come to our seminar at 5.30. There you go, the seminar at 5.30. They're going to have an ultimate, ultimate backcountry gear deal. But me, it's Kool-Aid and Spoons, man. That's what I've got for you. Make sure you come get something. Right there, sir, knock on. So with the, uh, I mean, a lot of this stuff's expensive. I mean, your two band and your rifle or bow, your 500 bucks of a pack, a couple hundred bucks of a boot, what would be the one thing you would say spend the money on? Yeah. Boots. 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 Boots in your pack. Boots in your pack. So, there's, there's very expensive backpacks out there. I'm not going to touch on that. I don't care about that. I love Aaron Snyder. Love him to death. Been friends with him since 2000. I mean, you're ever going to see a Kafaru pack on me, most likely. But I love the guy. I love his packs. I'm a Badlands guy. I'm a Tundra. I'll drive a Toyota Tundra. It's just what I like. This has worked for me. It's never let me down. It's never given me a reason to go look for something else. But I know there are some fantastic packs out there by other manufacturers. I just choose this one. I like it for a lot of reasons. It starts off, it's lightweight. You know what I mean? I'm not starting off with a nine pound pack. I'm starting off with a six pound pack. And it's got 5,000 cubic inches. And I've hauled bucks out of the back country with them. <coughs> right there, that summit pack's got it. Mark. I would say, no, you can't have those. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta talk about those. Sorry. Thank you. That guy that just said that had the other half of my buck in his backpack. No, that's a lie too, isn't it? Right. Tau hey, your camp. Towson, Towson Jenkins had my entire Wasatch buck in his pack. Hauling it off the mountain. And, and he didn't stop to breathe Never did. Tanner had one of my camps, because I took two camps up, because I was kind of moving around a lot. He took one of my camps, and this is me with the rest of what I had. Some of my butt, no, no, just my head, right? And my gear and part of the camp. But that Badlands pack was to the gills. All 55, yes, sir, that's you. All, all those 5,500 <laughs> 5, cubic inches were full, and that's, that's what goes in there. It's got a lot of good things about it. I love it. But uh, that's just what I use. So, if you got any questions about that pack, I can answer it, but I can't answer any other pack. Yes, sir, in the back. What do you, what do you use for wide? I use iodine, old school. I'm too lazy to pump, man. I don't like it. Nah. And you know what? Every year I come back from the backcountry, I just don't, I lose a lot of weight. I usually lose 10 to 15 pounds every hunt. And then I have issues for like a week. But I use iodine. <laughs> <laughs> Works for me because it's only that big. Mountain ops, mountain ops makes something to, to battle altitude sickness. By the grace of God, I've never experienced altitude sickness. And I've been up to over 14,000 feet. And I've not had any issues. Yes, sir. Pat, Pat. So I use Badlands Clones, but how often do you wash your pack, and how do you wash it? I wash my pack when I get back from every hunt that it gets bloody. I don't have any rhyme or reason, but when I get back and it's bloody, after I get everything unloaded, I'm home, kiss the wife, been home for a day, I leave the pack in the garage, and I take it down to the local car wash, and I hook it on the mat deal, and just inside and out, take it home, let it hang on the clothesline, dry for two days, it's good to go. Cleaned it out perfect. Yes, sir. Do you quarter out your deer when you shoot them and hike out, or do you bone them out? Deer, I'll quarter. Yeah. On the Wasatch, I just quarter them. Oh. And I try to get everything. I do the gutless method. The buck I killed, I felt pretty bad about it. The buck I killed with the year you guys were up there, uh, I didn't get the tenderloins out of it, but I shot that deer quartering to me. And on the exit wound, man, his, his gut was open, and I knew all of that was floating around inside there. And it was August, it was hot, and I was really just going fast. So I trimmed some neck meat off, I trimmed the brisket off, but I didn't get his tenderloins. But I didn't think the juice was worth the squeeze to open that deer up and get all that rumen and all of that. It's like, do I sacrifice all of it to get these two premium cuts, or do I need to make a decision right here on the mountain and say, it's probably best I leave those in there so I don't taint the other meat. Because a buck I did kill up here in August one year, we didn't find him for a day or for an afternoon. And when I found him, I did do the gut, and, and it ruined a lot of my meat when I exposed because it was another quartering shot. You shoot a big broadhead on a quartering shot, you're going to tear stuff open that you don't want to. That's just the way it goes. And so it's the juice worth the squeeze deal, right? Is that juice worth the squeeze? If you're in eight miles or six miles, is it worth Boning it? Boning it out. Yeah. Boning it out. Okay. And elk, all elk get boned okay. out. All elk get boned out. Um, yes, sir. Go 
my distance, how far I'll shoot. I practice really, really far, so it makes the realistic shots automatic. And I shoot every day. I shoot, if I've got the flu, if I've got the runs, no matter what. If I'm not feeling good, I'm going to shoot my bow every day because that's, I'm a bow hunter. I take it very serious. And I want to be absolutely deadly with my weapon, right? So I shoot my bow every day. So you're specifically asking me how far I'm comfortable shooting a deer. If he's broadside feeding in a willow patch, I'm comfortable shooting 100 yards. But I'm not going to anymore because I did that as a young man. And it was cool. I shot a lot of deer at 100 yards. I shot a lot of deer at 90 yards. I shot some deer at 80 yards. I can tell you this. Most of the animals I've ever shot and not recovered were inside 35 yards. They reacted to the shot. It was never about accuracy. It was about their reaction. I'm just going to be as blunt with you as I can. If I ever get a shot at a 200-inch mule deer, broadside and above alpine, and, and somebody said, you can shoot him at 30 yards or 60 yards, I'm going to take that 60-yard shot every day. That deer's never going to hear my bow go off. He's got his head in a willow patch. He's in la-la land. And I can hit your sunglasses nine times out of ten at 60 yards with my bow. And I'm good, enough, I'm good with that. I'm not bragging. That's just the fact. But uh, traditional guys, you know, I, I tried to go traditional this year. Loved it. I don't know if you guys followed my journey. There's a very low success rate. There's a very low recovery rate with that gear. And I just had to make a moral decision. Would it look cool to shoot something with a recurve? But after three hogs and two white-tailed does not recovered with my traditional gear inside 10-yard shots, I decided that wasn't for me. My conscience won't allow it. So anyway, that's a little preachy on that. But make sure you come get yourself something, sir. Yes, sir, right here. So I guess back to, to shooting, um, how do you get into so, – so say you're glassing on a hill and you see a, a deer that's a quarter mile away or a half mile away. How do you get close enough to shoot him with your gun? I get as close as I can, get the wind right, get as close as I can. Here you go, buddy. I carry wool socks with me and have for years. Two pairs of big, thick wool socks. And even the softest, quietest bridges, so we call them in Texas, bridges. When my bridges legs are going to rub together, right? That makes some sound. What I did on the last two bucks that I killed, I carried shorts with me. This year I made homemade. Badland shorts. Remember you seeing them in camp. So I put on first layer, like the spandex stuff, right? The first layer warm, put those on, camouflage, real tree, I think they're real tree. Then I put on my camouflage shorts so that my breeches legs don't rub together. And I put the two pairs of socks on and I'll either stalk in standing upright or I'll spider crawl, setting on my butt, feet and hands, especially in the high country, and I'll spider crawl down to them. This year, however, I'm going to be carrying these with me. These are called stalkasins. The man that makes them sitting right here in the audience over here, Tanner Howard. And they're in my, I was going to tell you about my boots, but I think I'm running out of time. I'm not a, I've never bought the same pair of boots twice in my life, but one time. And this, I'm in my second pair of these. I know there's hunting brand related. I know Crispy's a good boot, Kinetrek, the brothers, who are the brothers? Do y'all use theirs, I think, right? Crispy. Who am I talking about? Crispy. Y'all use Crispy's. Who's, oh yeah, you guys use Crispy. Who are the other ones? Um, anyway. Yeah, Lathrop Brothers. They make great boots. Personally for me, I, I can't talk about their product because I don't use them. But I know I bought my second pair of those, and that is the best waterproof, lightweight, load-bearing up to what I'll carry a 100-pound. You think about that. If you're buying tires, you got to think about your tread, your load-bearing, right? If you're going to put tires for a Civic on a Tundra to pull a boat trailer, you're going to put the right all-terrain tire on there, right? You're going to make sure that your boots can handle whatever load you're wanting. So don't get a flat sole. You're not going to put any Chuck Taylors on. I think they used to sell those Sal Cox talked about them once. Those Chuck Taylor looking shoes you get from Cabela's stalking shoes. Well, he wore them into the Nevada backcountry. He's like, man, I, I thought he was going to die. I wanted to cut my own feet off, right? So you got to make sure. Well, I've tried to stalk in those. As awesome as those are for hauling myself in and my bucks out, they're terrible for stalking. And so are as any other boot when you're in pea gravel. And Wasatch, or Utah in general, is the loudest place I've ever hunted. Yes, Dustin? What do you think is the biggest mistake that guys make stocking meal there? Patience. <laughs> There's 10 billion things you can do wrong. There's only like seven things you can do right. <laughs> but the biggest mistake is getting in a hurry. Uh, the biggest mistake, I think, is getting in a hurry. But you've got to hurry sometimes. And that's, if I decide that buck needs to die today, 
If the wind is right, I'm going to go down there and I'm going to shoot that buck or I'm not going to shoot that buck. And I've, I've failed. you got to fail a million times to get it right once. If I fail, I don't get him. It used to just haunt me. Even though, no matter how big he was, it would haunt me and it would affect me and make me not want to try the next time. You know, Have you ever missed a buck, a great buck, and immediately saw a little bitty buck and you shot it just to prove you could still kill a buck? <laughs> right? I've done that a bunch of times. My friends do that still today. I've missed a great buck. I'm broke down about it. i got to kill a buck, man. I hope I get another shot. Here's a 20-inch four-point. Wham! Perfect shot, because he, what's he going to do? He's got milk on his lips. <laughs> you shoot him, and man, you're going to get him, right? Well, don't do that. Keep hunting. Try to get you a big one if you want a big one. The same thing. Slow down, speed up, go after him. If you get him, great. But if you don't get him, don't let him keep you from trying to get him the next time. Keep going. Back to Stalkerson's. They weigh nothing. They're made out of leather. That man sells them. It's uh, TH Leather Crafts. You can find them on Instagram and Facebook. I only wanted to show these because I'm going to size for these today. And I know that there are some prolific, experienced, great mule deer hunters that live right here in this state. Uh, I don't even know him, but I know Kip Fowler used these this year. He's a local Utah legend. Killed a great buck wearing these, correct? And I remember the things he said. When He's one of those kind of guys, like when he talks, you listen, right? And he just said, man, these these things are incredible. They're game changer. And you were walking around on cactus, right? Cactus can't penetrate them. So when I'm closing in, I, the thing that once you get close is you got to make sure the wind is still good, but super quiet. Robbie Denning, I just heard him the other day. Robbie Denning is in this audience. He has two copies of this book, his book. I'm giving these away today. And he's going to autograph them for you, and you're going to get your picture taken with him if you want. He's right there. I'm going to embarrass you, buddy. But he's one of the greatest mule deer hunters we got around. And one of the most humble, God-fearing men I know. So I'd like to give these away to somebody. I'd like to give these away right now, actually. So um, that guy just raised his hand first. Come get the book real quick and ask me a question. I'll i got to go to this side of the room. I'll trade you this for that. <laughs> I should have told you about the books early on, right? Uh, sir, you. How, how do you keep track of where a buck is when you've got to go down a canyon, around the mountain? Good question. I started using about 10 years ago when digital cameras came out. I started using my camera and my rangefinder. So if I see a buck, that's how I killed my buck in uh, 2015 in the Wasatch. I took a picture of him across the canyon. I took a panoramic view. And I zoomed in on the buck and I went just off of the buck to a dead tree. Took a picture of that dead tree and I ranged it. You're not using an archery rangefinder. You're using a rifle rangefinder. No, I, use a, I have a thousand yard rangefinder. And so what I did was when I got up, I ranged that buck, and then I ranged the tree. So when I got around there, and I got to that tree, I knew from that tree straight downhill at 74 yards where the buck was, air, close. Then I started stalking in, and I come under a tree and looked up, and he was just laying there with two other bucks. I got 30 yards from him. Shot. It, was, it was amazing. That wow it was the best buck I ever killed. He didn't score anything. It was amazing that I did that. I was able to get him. Yes, sir? You talked about losing animals. In the backcountry, you make what you consider to be a solid shot on, a, on an animal with your archery gear. How long, generally, do you wait? You know, what's the balance between waiting, giving them a chance to expire, and letting them get you know, so far away because they can cover country? Wait. Yeah, bow hunting is bow hunting no matter where I'm at. Backcountry, East Texas woods, whatever. I hit a deer with my bow and arrow. The buck I shot in Texas this year at five minutes. I got five minutes, guys. The buck I shot in Texas this year with my bow and arrow, I shot him so perfect that I almost jumped out of my tree stand because I've been trying to kill him for a long time, and I ran over there and I got him. I mean, just like almost within five minutes, I shot him, but I knew he was dead, and I walked over there. I could see him laying in the pine trees, and I got him. If I shoot a buck, I shot a buck in 2008, 10 years ago, going away from him, he shot him right under the base of the tail, and it came out just in front of his, right here, came out right there, downhill. I watched him go down the drainage, up the other side, and I was three miles in, and I watched him go into some timber, I just went down, got my arrow, stuck it in the ground, took some pictures, and just went back to camp and just sat there all night. I was going to get down in the 40s that night. Next morning at daylight, I went and I found him. If I hit him and I've got good blood and I think I've got a good shot, I wait the customary 30 minutes. That's the standard. Because a mortally hit deer will lose all of his blood in 30 minutes. If it hits an artery, a vein, a liver, or something, he's going to bleed out. If I make a bad shot, I'm just going to read the sign and decide. But I will tell you this. This goes back to just being who you are. Once I know, I don't care where I'm at or what I'm hunting, 
once I know I put a mortal wound on an animal, the rest of my hunt is either I'm going to recover that animal or I'm not going to get one, but I'm not going to go shoot another one. And a lot of guys will, and that's your choice, and you do that. But I just put an arrow in something, and I know i got dark red liver blood on it. If you hit that deer from about this line to below back straps, from about here to here, your arrow goes plumb through him, he's going to die. He's going to die. Either from fever, sickness, or something from this rumen getting into his bloodstream, you're going to kill him. So I'll go look, and if I don't find him, I just punch the tag and go home, and that's it. Wish I got one, but I didn't get one. So anyway, can I help you out there? Yeah. God, I think I gotta wrap it up. Mr. Gray shirt, you're Mr. World Jim, you're the last one, buddy. I take Sean Dennison with me. He was an Eagle Scout. He's got everything. I think he's even got one of those poof in his in his backpack. Uh, I carry the essentials. I carry Tylenol sleep aids. Sometimes you get injured or you get sick in the back country and you just need to sleep it off. I'll take, I'll take, and sometimes you just can't go to sleep because of the boogers walking around your tent at night. Man, and that's what happened the night the bear decided to get in my tent was I took some Advil PM. And I was like, I didn't know what was going on. I kind of quit doing that. So, uh, would you like a book, sir? Sorry, I had something else. Sorry. Right. You already got it. So, uh, but I, use, I make sure I have something for a tourniquet, gauze, uh, Good heavy duty band aids and stuff. I don't use regular band aids. I get the good stuff, and uh, I, and band aids. And I carry moleskin for my feet. Open wounds get moleskin or duct tape. Would you like the book? Yeah. Yes. Come meet me halfway, man. Uh, if you asked a question and you did not receive anything, I would like you to come up and get that right now. And then until I'm ran off, I guess uh, I had a lot more to cover. But this was a good. This was a good audience, right? This is good stuff. We talked about good stuff, man. Thank you. Yes, sir. So, thank you so much. And I'm going to try like heck to get through all those slides. So if you missed it, it's only about footwear. Tomorrow, what I'm going to make sure I talk about that I didn't talk about today, here's the hook. I'm going to talk about staying scent free in the backcountry. So I know you're going to want to hear about that one. And we can talk about that later. But from right now, I'm going to go back to the Team Backcountry booth in about 30 minutes. So if you got questions I didn't get to, come back there and see me. So thank you guys for coming out. Appreciate it. Make sure you get with Rob and get your No, no, that's not. That's just what we just brought